thank you everybody. Thank you for joining us for our open source panel. We have a distinguished set of uh, uh, panelists here from a number of different companies who have many different insights in terms of open source uh, and how we can use it su successfully. And what I'd like to do to begin, because you do come from very different backgrounds, is to ask you to, to introduce yourself and explain a little bit what you do with open source and why you care so much about it. Because I know many of you are very passionate and I've already seen the passion. <laughs> I'll, I'll kick it off. My name is uh, Jan Wildeboer. I'm Red Hat's EMEA evangelist. And I work at a company that does $2 billion in revenue on a yearly basis with selling free software. So open source somehow is quite at the core of what we do. Uh, so my name is Chris Price. I work at Ericsson. Uh, we make a lot of money selling proprietary software. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I work at Ericsson in the open source domain. I work in a number of communities related to NFV and, and networking technologies. Um, and we can get into that later. Okay, I'm Bernd Himmelsbach. I'm with SAP. And there we made a big bet on OpenStack, actually. So all of our future, or already current, started with the uh, deployment of infrastructure as a service offerings within SAP is based on OpenStack. So we are all in in that part. Hi, I'm Ken Owens. I'm a uh, CTO for Cloud Native here at Cisco. Um, I've been involved in open source since way back in the early cloud days. Um, have been involved in many foundations that have started. And uh, as of recently, I'm on the um, Open Container uh, Foundation, OCI, and the CNCF, Cloud Native Computing Foundation. Um, and, and just like uh, you know, Bernard mentioned, I'm very involved in OpenStack as well. Excellent. So as you can see, it's a very diverse crowd who we'll look at, at things from very different angles. Uh, now, we have seen that open source has really increased dramatically in recent years. Okay, what are some of the changes that have occurred that have made this really happen? For example, open source today is very different than open source 10 years ago, and even five years ago, or three years ago. So what are some of these changes that are really making open source take off? So, of course, I'm very biased on this, so, so I will be totally honest about that. What we see is actually a quite simple thing. First of all, open source is highly professionalized nowadays. So if you look at the core projects that make up open source solutions like Linux distributions or middleware solutions, um, typically 80 to 90% of the developers working on that have jobs where they get paid to work on that, not only at Red Hat, but also at a lot of the companies here in this round and, and above. So what we see, what we feel and think is that open source is becoming the default, default uh, development model for software. Not necessarily a business model, because that's not what it is. It's a development model. A cooperative way of interacting. Combine that with the fact that we're moving to a software-defined world where hardware moves to the outer fringes of the stack. And in the stack, you have, you know, if you have a 100% stack, around about 80% of that functionality is non-competitive in nature. It's stuff everybody needs. So if you have non-competitive parts in your stack, it makes a lot of sense to start working together cross vertical and inside the vertical with your direct competition because it's non-competitive. And then you land at such projects like OpenStack and, and, and other things. It's a very natural movement. So what the press and everybody tries to say is a revolution. For me, it's an evolution. And you know, if you want to put an R in front of it, I'm fine with that. I think I can build on it a little bit. Um, I think open source is moving a little bit away from the, the traditional model of just collaborating on, on the lowest possible denominator to, to finding ways of exploring in the industry together on new ideas and new innovations. So what we see is, is when SDN came along, we all went and started to innovate in SDN in open source. That was the place we did it. Um, and, and new technologies for cloud containerization, we, we start to collaborate and, and explore these things together in open source. Uh, and it, and it's just a way of moving the industry faster. I mean, it, it, it allows us to uh, converge on common solutions much quicker. As I can just agree what you mentioned already, both of obviously. <laughs> but another aspect, what I want, like, would like to add is, um, on the SAP side, there was an interesting aspect on going open source as well to get in some kind of new vendor neutrality. It's about if you have to make a bet on a certain topic, you don't want to get locked in. <laughs> And with an open source environment, yes, you are locking in then to the open source community, but it's a community and on a single enterprise in there. And I think, I think what's been the biggest driver is um, the business need to innovate quicker and to get services out faster. Because in, in the past, it's kind of tied to the lock-in point, right? That 
if you needed to make a change for your software, you had to go talk to some vendor and say, hey, I want you to make this change. And most of those vendors would say, well, we'll put it onto our backlog or on our roadmap, and maybe six months from now, we'll give you an update as to how we're addressing that, that request, right? And when you have an open source community, you just make a pull request. And if you can convince enough of the community that this is a good thing to do, within a couple of weeks, you may have that, that patch available to be used, right? So it's a, I think that's what's really driving enterprises and developers to really want to adopt open source is just the speed of change you can get things done in. Yes. <clears throat> Let's build on that a little bit. Uh, in each of your companies, you've used open source to solve a problem. What problem was that? How did you solve it? And what challenges did you overcome? Well, I'm out of that discussion because we do nothing <laughs> else. I mean, sorry, the <laughs> floor is yours. I'll, I'll start. So um, at, at, at Cisco, one of the problems we were trying to overcome was um, OpenStack is a, a large project and has a lot of different components to it. And, and none of them have to do with your application architecture at all. It's all about your infrastructure. And, and we were trying to convince a lot of people that we worked with and a lot of our partners that they should be using OpenStack and they should be developing their applications on OpenStack and they come right back to us and say, that's great, I want to do that, but where's my message queue? Where's my database you know, services? Where's my you know, cloud native con you know, composition components that I need to be able to compose applications with? And so the way we addressed that problem was looking at at not where the industry was today with monolithic applications, but how do you enable cloud native applications? And so we were, you know, three years ago, very early adopters of Docker and of Kubernetes and Mesos to sort of try to figure out how to create a cloud native application environment in an open source project that would then help drive developers to use OpenStack without having to understand that they're using OpenStack. It just runs on OpenStack. Well, actually, on our side, we would it address at least <coughs> three problems or three challenges uh, w with one approach there. So the, the first one is um, about it from based on history and based on acquisitions within our company. We had the luxury of at least 23 different optimized stacks for a certain uh, payload. And uh, of course, you don't want to keep that forever. So then you're looking towards, OK, where can you converge on? And that was then, from an infrastructure as a service perspective, that was then the reason why we started to look into OpenStack um, and made then the bet on top of that. Because yeah, what else could you do at that point in time besides going then into when the login at a certain time? I mentioned that already before. The, third, uh, the second thing is um, about the being able to, to introduce your own needs and your own demands so that you can contribute upstream by yourself and you don't have to wait until um, any of your, your vendors would provide you with a solution. And the third thing, obviously, is as well, um, it's when we do come from a uh, view that you mentioned the cloud native applications. It was also a demand on our side that there are certain uh, servers were built on, together on Cloud Foundry basis, and then you do need some kind of uh, environment uh, which is cloud native and it was a natural game where that would be with the, if you deploy it not in a public cloud in your own data center then you would go with a with an open stack environment so that were the three areas which we addressed with our approach and going forward with the open source and in this case specifically with open stack um, so I can add competence um, is one of the key things that you get from an open source domain. If, if, if I look back in my years, and I had many years at Ericsson, um, we would hear rumors of a new platform coming out, and then someone would be working on it, and then we might get a sniff at it, and we might see it, and about three years later, we would be able to develop and deploy on it. Um, you compare that to something like, well, let's just stick to OpenStack as a theme. As soon as OpenStack was made available, everyone had access to it. Everyone could ramp up on it. Everyone could learn the constraints and, and the opportunities. Uh, and, and when you have a company of 100,000 plus people, it's, the, it's, it's such a great tool to help get everyone up to speed as quickly as possible. Yeah, so, well, there's one thing I would like to add. One of the things we do at Red Hat is <laughs> helping uh, customers that failed with open source because they didn't really understand how to use it and what to do with it. That's quite a part of our business, you know, and, and that's quite good. But we're moving that to the next level now where we have customers that 
we effectively co-develop the solutions with. You know, in, in the case of OpenShift, uh, we have customers that are actively working on this. So one of these customers came to us and said, we looked at OpenShift and it's not good enough for us. You know, it, it misses a lot of things. And we're like, okay, what's the requirements? Old fashioned software business, give me a requirement list, we will look at it and we will see if we can implement it. And we looked at it, it they came back with 300 pages of requirements, you know. And, and we were like, this is impossible. We just bought the company that made OpenShift, formerly it was called Makara. We just bought that company, it's a 35 people engineering team. We can add 20 people to that, but still, you know, getting them up to speed, we all know that this doesn't work. So we made a, a different proposal and we said, you have 5,000 developers in your organization. You know exactly what you want and we think your requirements make sense for the product in general. How about you develop all the features to your customer with your developers? You give us the code as Red Hat, we will put it in the new version of OpenShift and you will pay for your own code. Does that make sense to you? You're going to pay for the code you've written yourself. And this customer looked at us for 10 seconds, <laughs> you know, as if we were coming straight from whatever place. But then he said, this really makes sense because we are not a software distribution and software maintenance company. We are in a different field. I'm not going to tell you which customer this is, but they're a very big customer in a certain vertical. And they said, you know, software maintenance and, and you know, security patches is not our core business, but it's Red Hat's core business. So yes, let's work together. So we work together, their developers, our developers, community developers in one physical office. And then we found out we need containers and we need to scale them. And so we switched everything away from what we had before into Docker. And then uh, uh, they said, yeah, but we cannot do everything in one container. We need to orchestrate them. And we're like, yeah, you know, we're arrogant. We're Red Hat. Let's develop our own orchestration layer. Failed after two months, catastrophically. You know, it's, Red Hat should not build their own stuff. You know, let the community do the real stuff and then we'll package it. That's our job. So another company knocked on our door and they said, hey, we have an orchestration layer and it's already handling billions and billions of containers in production. It's a company some of you might know, they're in the search engine business, you know, they're called Google. And, and so, so we put Kubernetes into the, into the solution. So now we had the Google developers, the Red Hat developers, the customer developers and community developers all working together. And I think that's an important aspect. You, know, you see a similar thing with OpenStack. You had the first phase where Everybody thought they're going to do their own open stack, you know, yet companies that got a lot of venture capital for creating another version of open stack, which is not exactly what upstream is doing. And now that's getting into a commodity layer and a commodity business, and there are some big failures, but also some progress. But we're moving into a world where customers take the responsibility of the stack in-house again and not offloading that responsibility at a vendor, no matter if it's open or proprietary. So with that new way of thinking on the CIO level comes these opportunities that change the customer vendor relationship into a more gray area of, of collaboration and cooperation, which I think is very important for the future. Excellent, very good description. Now um, along those lines, we also, know OF, we also know that open source can be expensive to implement and use and so forth. And maybe burn from SAP's point of view, how do you do it? Who does the integration? How, who pays for it and so forth to use open source? I didn't get the question there. Do you, do you speak to up. Use, sorry, to use open source can be very expensive at times. It can, yeah. How do you do it? Who pays for it? Who does the integration? And who pays for it in SAP? Uh, well, actually at SAP we are following a two-fold approach. Um, on one hand side, in certain areas we are using a distribution. Um, other areas, we don't use a distribution, so we actually, I don't want to say we build our own distribution, but we use our own patching, deployment, orchestration methods. And probably questions are coming up, they know why you're doing that in a two-fold approach. But there's basically two different use cases. So on one end side, we need the flexibility to influence it from really strongly by ourselves in a very short innovation cycles. And in other areas, uh, we, uh, we, have to, we want to have a st stable, area when it comes to that it's also transportable to a customer side so that you can have private cloud deployment. There you typically don't want to get into this, another distribution business so that's more or less for, uh, we need to solve certain problems in-house and therefore we, we are using that in the non-distro area. Yeah. But when it comes to being able to deploy something on a customer side, then we don't want to be in the, uh, in the distribution business. Who pays for that? Uh, it's basically, uh, there was this, 
as in all big enterprises, there are cost allocations, uh, and it's uh, in certain areas it's uh, pay per use. So, like in, in public IAS, in certain areas where a dedicated environment are located there, it's uh, it's like a flat rate. How much independent, how much you use, up to a certain limit. So. I think. So on the topic of, of open source being expensive, I think software in general is expensive. Um, you, you can estimate about a million lines of code to be 20 to 40 million US dollars to produce. Um, and then you can estimate that that million lines of code in order to continue to use it and sustain it is going to require about a 60% investment in maintenance, adaptive maintenance essentially. Um, so for every million lines of code you have out there, you need a large workforce to maintain it and sustain it. Um, and that includes the community that is actually active in open source, but also the communities that consume it and feedback through, through vendors um, and, and, and uh, packaging groups. Uh, so I think one of the, one of the things that, that's happened in the last year is lots of open source communities have started up, lots of initiatives have been formed, and, and a lot of the time not enough thought has gone into what is the cost of this, the long-term cost. Starting a community is easy, getting into software there is easy, maintaining it so that it matures to the point where it's, where it's you know, to be usable like Linux and, and, and distributable in the same sort of a context, very expensive and a long process. Um, and I think there is a lot of pushback in the industry beginning now in that we have so much going on. Um, how is this manageable? Where are we going to focus our efforts? Uh, what is the return on investment for people putting money into this? Uh, and I think from, from the perspective of, is, as a general statement, it's really important to have a good idea of where your return on investment is coming from. And it's also very good to be aware of the cost of actually getting involved in the first place. Um, I think it's, it's, it's something that our industry in general is going through a learning around as we commercialize open source. Um, it needs an ROI. My, my kids need to eat. Um, so I mean, it's, it's, it is a learning and it's something which I, I believe is happening now. I don't believe it's necessarily settled, but, but moving forward, I, I expect to see a little bit more focus on the costs associated with software development in collaborative groups. I, I think, think, I think one, of the main, sorry, but one of the main points that many people forget all the time is um, it's not so much about technology, it's really about a cultural shift in the organization. You cannot use, for, let's take a buzzword, let's take DevOps. You know, DevOps, wonderful buzzword, agile, blah, 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 scrum, all of this cool, cool fancy stuff. Um, the thing is, when you have a monolithic IT stack in your organization, that doesn't matter. You need to have a very modular approach in your IT to be able to use all of these container technology, DevOps approaches, and etc. So a lot of the things we're seeing right now is the cultural change in organization away from the silos. One of the big cost factors, you, know, you, you said we have a sort of our own distribution. The thing is, when, when you make a decision there to do something that upstream doesn't do, now you are responsible for that and that's where the costs explode. So the better solution ultimately is, we need this and that feature and we have a good reason for that, so how do we get this upstream? because then the rest of the community and everybody participating will take care of that additional feature. This is what we're seeing right now with OpenStack in a very intensive way. You, you mentioned NFE, you know, NFE, I was involved in NFE three years ago when we kicked off the OP NFE project, when we talked on the Etsy level on, and, and the telcos told me, we are telcos. We are a very special group of companies. We have requirements that nobody else in the business has. <laughs> And I'm like, yeah, that's what Ericsson and, and Huawei told you for the past 30 years, and it was really good for their <laughs> business. But honestly, it's not that simple. Let's take it. What are your special requirements? So I got the special requirements, and I said, well, this is, by the way, exactly what the finance sector is asking for in their stacks. So how can we combine these efforts? And then the telcos looked at me like, we never thought about that. And I said, well, you should, because they have similar requirements. So let's make all of that upstream and open stack. So this way of using open source, that's the cultural change that everybody is working for, working on and looking for. And I think we still have a long way to go there, but at least we all went that direction, so we're moving. It just added to that part, you mentioned it's expensive to, to, to build software. And yes, indeed, it's actually to avoid that kind of, that you have a downstream fork. Yeah. And that's really something which uh, requires, uh, well, some strong guidance, I would say, into the teams, not to deviate from that. And it's the easiest way to do a fork because you can even yeah. be faster than in the community because you can implement it by your own. But uh, then you're building up that cost, the follow-up cost yeah. that you cannot upgrade and all that. You know, kind of upstream, stuff. So that's, 
upstream solves your problem a year later in a slightly different way, now you have to think, are we going to take the upstream solution, and that means we have to get rid of the stuff we had, or are we going to keep our patch, which is not compatible yep. with what upstream is doing? Whatever way you do, you have cost. And I'm not saying that's wrong. That's absolutely not. I'm just saying be aware of that. Yeah, don't yeah. think, so also in the audience, don't think forking an open source project to solve your immediate problem is going to help you in the mid and long term. It's going to be the exact opposite. This is the kind of stuff I get as feedback from customers who went that yeah. road and they said, we have an exploding cost that we've never expected. And I'm like, yeah, well, you know, talk to us next time and then we'll fix it for you. I think <laughs> a, a, good, a good rule of thumb there is if the adaptive maintenance cost of something is around about 60% of the, of the cost of investment, if it's on trunk, yeah. the further you move away from trunk, in other words, the further your fork moves away, that just continues to grow. And you can end up at a like 200% cost yeah. increase running on a fork than, than on, the, on yeah. the main line. And you need an ROI if you're going to make that decision that's going to support yeah. that. One of, the, one of the new trends that I'm seeing is um, open source projects are, are giving you a limited version of their software that's, that's on the trunk. And then if you want additional features or additional capabilities, they have a commercial version that they'll sell you that still uses trunk, but they have additional things they've added to it. And so it's, it's a similar discussion that that's just another version of a fork that they might be taking care of, but you're paying for that excess cost whenever you do that. So it's, it's open source plus additional but the neutrality is then gone well that's not open source <laughs> right. that's, that's, that's open core open i'm yeah. fundamentalist i'm really yeah. sorry about this a religious fundamentalism now no that's open core and it actually makes sense in in specific niche markets and niche cases but one of the things that drives us is how can we abstract that to make it part of that 80 percent that is yep. non-competitive so you know that's simply the better approach is the exactly. one we've learned so as, as a as a fundamentalist how do you how do you view um, stable, stable forks. Well, that's our business. You know, this is what we do at Red Hat. But then you're forking. Yes. Yeah. And we're open about it. So, so when we create a new version of, for example, Red Hat Enterprise Linux, you know, we have the upstream work in the communities. Then we have the community distribution, Fedora, and then we take a snapshot from Fedora and say this is going to be the stable new release of Red Hat Enterprise Linux. But we know about this, and we are taking the responsibility to support that with forward and backporting for 10 years. So it's, is, so it's a big decision okay, to make. So, so it's okay if you take a conscious decision? Yes, of course. Okay. But that's, you know, that's not the way it, so organizations start with something, somebody forks, doesn't really tell about it because you know, it's just, ah, oh, now we don't need that upstream change, we do it this way. And then people forget about it, teams change, yeah. other developers come in, some people don't touch the code for a few years. And then after three, four years, the compliance department kicks in and says, we need to look at this, we need to audit this stuff. And then everybody's suddenly like, whoa, what, what, sorry, what's going on here? And, and how can we deal with yeah. it? Especially when you look at embedded market, you know, when we look at, at all the stuff we have in embedded and IoT markets that are growing right now, this is going to be one of the problems. How do you get them updatable and how do you have a defined update and upgrade path for all of the stuff you're using? That's a big question. Let's see, so some of what we talked about here were mature open source projects. There are lots of important open source projects underway now, many of which are midstream. How do you deal with these midstream projects? How should, how should all of us deal with midstream open source projects? Uh, well, as a P, we do FDR, some kind of, let's call it guidelines. You need to classify the project. And then it's classified, especially in the way how you want to deal with that. And if it's a, mature project, especially when it comes to MNET open source components in your in the SAP ecosystem software piece in there. So we do that as well. And then you really have to be very strict on towards that you identify responsibilities in order to doing the, the backporting if that is required. If there's not a strong enough community, you never know how long the in a special project even the community, community stays active. So it needs to be a very conscious decision towards how we have three different kinds of models which you follow there, um, which will become applied to that certain project, and that uh, and you need to stick to that decision. You cannot jump around afterwards on that. Now there's some there's some tools to help you with. So, as I said, you know when we take something into our products in our distribution, we typically talk about a 10-year support cycle that we simply offer as part of the subscription. So we look at the sustainability of these projects. And, and one of the things you, you can and should do is, it's open source, so you, know, you have the commit messages. 
So you go through the commit messages and there are tools to visualize that. One of them is called GORS, so like source but with a G at the start. And it visualizes in a very attractive way the developers coming in making uh, uh, changes to files and, and, and then you get a sense for how this community is working. Is it just one guy doing everything? Is it a distinct group? Are people coming in and moving out? Are more people coming in than moving out? And, and that, that gives you an indication. The second thing you must always keep in the back of your mind is this project might completely fail for totally non-obvious reasons. I've seen successful open source projects fall apart and fork themselves over the decision that they couldn't take on how to name the new version of their project. One wants to call it after his girlfriend and the other one wants to say 3.0 and, and they actually forked. They came back after a few years, so that's fine. So in your architecture, you must make sure by having the API sorted, by having the input output layers well defined, that you can always replace one thing with the other at ideally zero migration cost. That's one of the things you just have to keep in your mind. If that's not part of your architecture, then you have to be aware that you might incur exponential costs along the road. And if a, com if a community goes down or if you see a, a community struggling, what we do is very simple. We hire them. You know, when, when, when you hire developers, and we tell them, this is one of the things we do at Red Hat, we hire them and tell them 90% of your work is continuing to work upstream. It's only 10% internal Red Hat work, backporting and stuff. Effectively, we're paying you to stay in the community. This is a huge motivational factor. Some people burn out after a few years of just doing this the open source way. So give them an opportunity to grow in that world. And then it starts working. Any other comments for these midstream type uh, open source projects? Um, okay, maybe, or I can ask it a little differently. When people are trying to figure out whether or not they should use a, a midstream open source project, how should they go about analyzing the health, the maturity of one of these projects? What metric should they use? What metric should we use to decide, should we use this or not? Because before they get bought yeah. by uh, <laughs> Hired, I should say. Sorry. Or by Oracle. <laughs> so I know I, I look at like the number of contributors to the project mm -hmm. and the diversity of those contributors. Are they all from the same company or the same startup or are they from multiple different industries, right? So, yes. so to me, I think contribution um, diversity is one performance, is one parameter. And I also think the number of, um, of updates they're making to the project and the frequency of those updates is an important number to understand. Yeah, I mean, I, I would add a, a lot of the metrics are indicative of the community itself. Um, a, a community, a midstream community has to have a purpose. It needs to be doing something with the sources to, to provide to, a, to an end community. Understanding what the purpose of that midstream community is and what they're trying to achieve is, is a great way of trying to figure out, is this the right place for me? Are they speaking my language? Are they addressing my needs? Um, beyond that, then you look at whether it's, whether it's functional, of course. Um, does it fork from upstream or does it contribute back upstream? Uh, there's a number of really simple things which can help you understand first how healthy is the community today and, and in two years time is it still going to be healthy or are they going to be stuck there floundering on a bunch of forks that they haven't managed properly? I think there's a number of things to look at. It's really hard to answer that one on a, on a panel. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Another thing you can do is, uh, doesn't work for all projects, but first of all, if it's important and relevant to what you are doing, try to participate in the community. Excellent. See how complicated it is to get patches and, and features in. Uh, what kind of discussion level they have on the mailing list. Is it aggressive? Is it cooperative? Um, go to conferences like, you know, just a few weeks ago we had FOSDEM in Brussels, the biggest open source gathering with 7,000 open source developers from all over the world. Go to their meetings, have a beer with them, see if it clicks on a personal level. There's a lot of things you can do, but not necessarily should do. If, if, if it's something that you see a lot of people are using and there's a stable community and they've been around for a few years, it's probably not a big risk. One thing you should not do is create your own community for every little twitch you feel. Because you know it must be purpose-driven for long sustainability. Corporate-driven communities typically don't work because they don't accept uh, patches from outside their own organization. Uh, they are very secretive about roadmaps, and even if they claim to be totally open source, they aren't. A true open source project must accept that the responsibility for the project can move away to someone else at any time. 
If that's not part of your strategy and that, you will have a problem. And that's also in part probably to add in turn, not always to look only just onto the uh, open source project what you are interested in, as well as to ask yourself whether you're willing to contribute. Yeah. And that's also a good indicator to uh, if I'm not really willing to contribute, because then you have to ask yourself if it really addresses your needs and uh, yeah. are you willing to do that investment. So that's then some kind of an uh, opposite direction to look at. Yeah, I'll, I mean, mid midstream communities can be can be helpful. I I, I was participating for the quite a lot in, in OPNV when it formed, and OPNV formed because the telecommunications community had a difficult time communicating with OpenStack, had a difficult time contributing, um, and and so this 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 community was essentially formed to help move the telecommunications community in the direction that the, the open source community was going, and also provide a back channel to come the other way, you know, bring, bring open source people into the domain of telecommunications so they can better understand what it is that the telecommunications industry is trying to achieve. So yeah. I, I think, from, from the perspective of don't spin up a project unless you have a need, I mean, we spun that up because we felt there was a need. It's, it's a relatively healthy community. Uh, it's certainly serving a purpose and addressing a market. So yeah. I think there's, um, there's, there's it, it's, it's always a judgment call, and at the end of the day, it costs a lot to do software, and if you're not willing to invest in the long term on that, don't start. Great, great insights. Uh, <clears throat> let me bring up a related question. Security. So we want open source uh, software to be secure, and one of the advantages, at least that we often talk about, is that there potentially could be a million eyes on a piece of code. Often, though, that's not quite the case. And with things like the recent uh, bugs found in OpenSSL and NTP and so forth, we found pieces of the critical internet infrastructure which had problems. How can we help address this in the future? How can, for these projects which we need to be secure, get the right set of eyes on them to make sure that we don't have uh, problems like that? Or what are the best practices, essentially? Because that's what we want to share here, the best practices for how to aspire to prevent security problems in the future. Well, first, we need to make sure that we're talking about the same thing. You uh -huh. know, when we had uh, Heartbleed, uh, uh, the SSL stuff, um, don't forget, the moment Heartbleed was made public, the patches were also available. Yes. Now, let's come, we, we come back to the point I made earlier. You must have a clear upgrade and update path for the use of your open source project. If you have companies that cannot update these libraries with, like this, you know, then it's simply not my problem anymore. The problem we have in open source is that everything is public. The biggest advantage of open source is that everything is transparent. The biggest problem, especially with security in open source, is that everything is transparent. So we have organized that in the background. You know, stuff like Heartbleed, there is inter-distribution contacts on all of this. Um, SAP and other companies participate in this. We coordinate this stuff. We make sure the patches are available, which doesn't always work. Sometimes you have whatever weird hacker that wants to make a personal reputation about going immediately online with a zero day. But trust me, in the proprietary world, things are not better, to put it <laughs> friendly. <It's, laughs> we know that, that proprietary companies sometimes sit on really dramatic bugs. You know, Microsoft just announced that their complete security updates will be postponed for a full month. Let's take a, uh, we don't want to be better than bad. No, no but no, we want, but, to, but, well, what are the best we want to understand the specifics it? of yes. open source. Yes. The specifics are it happens in the open, we solve it in the open, we open ourselves up to much more scrutiny and much more research and people looking at our stuff, but potentially we also use a lot of projects that nobody looks at. There is a lot of dead or almost unused code out there, so again, focus on what you really need, don't go with excessive features that you will never use because all these code paths that you don't use that often it could be contain a lot of potential security risks. Yes. Nicely said. Yeah. Um, I can chime in. I, I think open source provides you with one target. It's, everyone has the same target, so they're going to find the problems <laughs> and they're going to, and, and when they hit, they can hit broadly, right? So open source yeah. creates a problem, but open source, as, as you say, also provides you one solution. Yes. So you can solve the problem. Um, I think. That's just a fact that we have to deal with uh, as, as we move into a collaborative world and we start to develop in, in the open more and more. Uh, best practices, I think, is something that the industry is starting to look at, especially since Hardbleed, you have the Linux Foundation with the, uh, with the open chain procedures for, for ensuring that how you develop software and how you manage the software in open source communities 
is actually done in the best way to ensure it's done in a secure manner. Um, there's, there's a lot of work in the industry now on, on working with collaborative communities and getting best practices in place. I'm not an expert, um, but, I, but I do know it's happening. Um, and I think in, in general, it's, it's not so much open source itself, but I think when you're doing open source, you leverage open source. And DevOps, the, the, the way that we pull things in and we construct things and we build things, dynamically from references which we may have from Maven or you know it, it can come from anywhere it can be from anywhere and it's very hard to actually track what it is that we're putting together it's not open source itself specifically but it, it's certainly within that domain I think the DevOps practices that we have today are, are, are a real concern because a lot of the time we don't know what we're building uh, and a lot of the time we can never reproduce what we just built yeah. so it's it's a it's a huge issue yeah. Is there to be honest, we don't distinguish too much between uh, closed source software and open source software. That they would be apply the same principles or processes around that. That with an SAP, we did um, establish a, a third team which does monitor whether it's commercial software, whether it's open source software, um, to monitor the uh, ongoing stuff and whether there are uh, uh, vulnerabilities or whatever. And then then agile methods to allow you typically to react faster than in the normal commercial environment. But in general, no differences, I would say. That's uh, due to the best practices you know from your normal non-open source software as well. I know a lot of the best practices we've been seeing come out of Linux foundations are um, part of the development process now involves code um, testing as part of the check-in process. So. Um, they're basically doing a security scan and security audit as part of the development process now. And then when you, um, as, a, as a consumer of open source, when you get the software, you should validate the software yourself, right? You should do your own scans, your own um, uh, penetration testing just to make sure that, that they didn't miss something or that what you care about, you know that you're capturing what you care about at least with your own scan. And then the, the third thing is in the industry, the, um, something called the Cloud Security Alliance, CSA. Uh, they've defined some really good best practices for infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, and software as a service, and things that these are rules and these are roles that you'd expect to have in place if you're going to run or operate your software in these different environments. And so at least you have a starting point to look at what are the questions I should be asking my provider, or if you're an SAP, what are the things I should be implementing that the industry calls best practices within my environment, so. And let's not forget reality. Out there we have giant cloud computing offerings from Amazon and from Google. I'm not saying Microsoft because that's not open source yet. Um, so we have seen a lot of security issues in the past few months and, and years, but stuff like Amazon and Google did not go down completely due to that, and it tells you that on these very big scale deployments, which are very public and very directly accessible with extremely high speed bandwidth and connections, we have quite a good solution to these problems. It's not perfect in all regards, but the, so far the security record of open source has been quite good, and we should not forget that. Yes, yes. Yeah. A couple of you mentioned OpenStack. So if we look at OpenStack, it's an example of a mature open source project. Is it would we view it as successful? Would we view it as a failure? Would we say it's too early to decide? What are your thoughts and why? I'm not saying anything. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to chime up. I feel obliged to speak. Um, Thanks, Christopher. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, I mean, OpenStack, yes, it's a successful project. Um, it's, it's having challenges. It didn't win the public cloud battle in North America. Oh, dear. Um, does, does that mean it's a dead project? Absolutely not. It's, it's one of the healthiest and most active projects that we have ongoing at this point in time. Um, it has its challenges. It has challenges with governance and, and, and code management and, and opinions like any other open source project. Yes. Um, to say it's mature, I think it's more of a teenager than, than mature. I think as, as an entity, it's certainly established itself as the common ground for cloud computing and the common ground to discuss various cloud technologies. Uh, we have things like the CNCF spinning up to decide because OpenStack failed to address certain aspects. Um, that's not complete failure, right? There's nothing to say that OpenStack can't talk to CNCF and solve the problem. So I, I, it's just a learning curve and, and you miss some things, you have to gain some things back. As long as it doesn't you know, close its eyes and just focus 
down into some ditch somewhere. I think it's going to be a healthy community for, for much longer. I can agree. It's uh, from our perspective a well managed community, the big one. It's uh, I would also call it healthy. Is it mature? It's it's teenagers probably a good <laughs> a good explanation. It's out of the uh, out of kindergarten definitely. Um, but nevertheless, a lot of stuff ahead of you, especially in certain areas where you have very specific needs, and when it comes then to the large enterprise readiness. But um, I wouldn't uh, rate it in any way in order, okay, failure or whatever, not at all. It's, as I said, yeah, we, we made a big bet on that, so we, <laughs> we're carrying on that to the adult stage. I think, I think a large part of the industry has made a big bet on yeah. that as well, which is, yeah. And there's basically no alternative, to be honest, right? Or can you there, tell me? There were, there were, there were, there, there were, were alternatives. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah. you can say success because there are no longer alternatives. Yeah. <laughs> now one of the things with OpenStack is, you know, it, 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 it's quite mature in some parts, especially when, when you look at the fundamental architecture. But that's then also becoming a problem because uh, OpenStack made a very big bet on, on virtual machines and virtualization. We're moving away from that. The industry is moving towards containers and, and, and you know, many people call containers lightweight virtualization, which is kind of like the most crazy way to describe uh, it. Uh, <laughs> but so now we, we are, everybody's working on how to do you get container into the OpenStack vision and, and way of looking at it. And that's holding some things back. It's progressing on some other ends. When we look at how the things are moving towards a more software-defined model, especially when we look at storage and the storage part in Cinder and et cetera in OpenStack, how that is moving. People should never think that OpenStack is a product that has a version number and that you download and install. It's a huge project, it's more a process where you make specific picks on, I'm going to use this part of, of uh, OpenStack in this specific way because that fits my architecture, so how do I participate on that? It's, it's a fluid thing, it's not a real rock solid wall. That's, in my opinion, a perception that many people got wrong in the beginning, in the first phase of, hype and, and you know when everybody was like, oh wow, OpenStack is going to rule the world. That didn't happen. But it created something very much more important. It created the awareness across the whole industry that we can and should work together on the basic building blocks of an IT infrastructure. I, I think and that's the big point. I think, I think there are good parallels yeah. to draw there. Uh, if I think of Linux, 25.6 million lines of code at the moment, uh, I don't think all of that goes into any Linux distribution. In fact, yeah. there are hundreds of Linux distributions serving hundreds of different verticals. And, and Linux is a mature and successful project. And I think the, the way you talk about OpenStack, it's, it's, it's more of a process or it's a collection. It's not one given thing. Yeah. I think that actually speaks to the health of the community yeah. in that it will and, and continues to address a number of vertical markets. Yeah. And that's, that is a, the hallmark of a large scale successful project, yeah. I would say. That's okay. No, okay. I was just going to kind of divert, the, you know, go a little bit against the the grain here. That I think OpenStack is at a point where they're they're at a crossroad because they're a little bit too late. They they to your point with the containers, they've they're trying to figure out how they can make a pivot. And so I'm I'm not sure if you know I think they're at a teenage maturity, and they're either going to make it into adulthood or they're going to just fall back into infancy and you know fail. And I'm not sure which <laughs> one yet, but. A, I think they're at a, at a turning point right now that um, there are companies, big companies like SAP and others that have adopted OpenStack and that's not going to go away anytime soon, but there's a whole large industry out there that is moving away from do it yourself and moving just to Amazon or moving to Google and doing the containers and not even thinking about OpenStack at all. And so we have to figure out as a community, you know, part of my job in the cloud name is working with, this, with uh, the OpenStack community and saying how do we how do we make this transition to cloud native with OpenStack? And working with the Cloud Foundry community, and how do we make the transition to cloud native with Cloud Foundry and with OpenStack, right? Because they're all Linux Foundation projects. And within the Linux Foundation, they all have their own separate roadmaps that they're working towards. And trying to bring all that together, and you know, thankfully we have partners like Red Hat that are helping to like, bring some of the maturity of how do you manage large projects together. And so it's, it's, it's going to be interesting, I think, to see what happens over the next couple of years. Yes, yes. So one last question, because one of our colleagues here needs to catch a plane, so we'll do this quickly. 
uh, open source has been had a huge impact in many transformations. What do you think are some of the upcoming disrupted technology transformations that open source will impact? You know, just hit, hit the, the topic, one or two from each of you. Yeah? We already did finance, we already did stock exchanges, we already did, we're now very good on our way in telco. So it's, you know, it's getting tough to find something that could re. <laughs> um, no, honestly, I think that the most interesting stuff with it that we're seeing right now is um, in, in the um, IoT space, mm -hmm. in, in embedded stuff where we're not only having open source, but we are now also seeing clear moves towards open hardware and open architectures. Yes. So that would be my most interesting thing. But that's also a very complicated market where a lot of things have to be experienced and built. But I'm looking forward to it. You took one of mine. <laughs> um, you can agree with prior speakers, too. You can just say all I agree and then, no. you know, we're done. <laughs> <laughs> It, it may be the wrong event to say it, but I, I would say open source is going to redefine how the internet works. Mm -hmm. um, at the end of the day, uh, the, next, the next great thing is how operators run their networks and how they deploy software and how they build their networks. It's being impacted already by open source software and technologies, and I think that's going to redefine how we establish and, and manage connectivity in the, in the broader, uh, well, around the globe, globally. I mean, it, it's going to redefine the internet. That's disruptive. <laughs> You're bringing something up on the SDN area, though so even that's also a long talk already, but still not there where we want to be. Um, so when it comes to the next big thing, in, I, my bet would be also on the big data and the IoT stuff there. That's basic where I'm a little bit biased on that part based on for what we are using OpenStack in our site. So I, I, to, to me, there's two big areas um, that haven't been covered. One is um, healthcare and kind of the back office processes within enterprises. So those those two um, industries, if you will, I think are very ripe for, for in innovation to happen within them. And then I think in a, along the lines of IoT, the mobile app space is, is still very much a, it's some openness, but there's mostly closed systems in there. And I think that's where, as you look at the evolution of devices and device management, you're going to see mobile, the mobile network environments change a lot. Cool, excellent. So we have a lot of exciting times ahead with us with open source. Uh, so let's give a thank you to our distinguished panel here for joining us. Thank you so much. Thank you.